bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard, and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And, all right, so today's webinar is titled uh, Leveling the Playing Field, Promoting Leisure for Children with Disabilities. And we're very excited to bring our two, two speakers to the CAFC Presents stage today. I've, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Majnumer and Dr. Chicago Thomas for, for a few years now, uh, helping, uh, mostly helping uh, to connect uh, the CAFC rehab community, which we call the Canadian Network for Child and Youth Rehab, or CINSER, uh, connecting that rehab community with a number of their research projects and other consultations that they've uh, sort of hosted over the, the, the last number of years. So it's a real pleasure to bring our presenters to the CAFC Presents stage. So uh, let me do a quick introduction here. First, we have uh, Dr. Annette Majnumer, uh, she, who is an occupational therapist uh, with doctoral training in the neurosciences. She's the director of the School of uh, Physical and Occupational Therapy and Associate Dean in the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University in Montreal. She's also a research associate at the Montreal Children's Hospital and the McGill University Health Center. Uh, Dr. Keiko Chicago Thomas is uh, also is an occupational therapist with doctoral training in rehabilitation science and postdoctoral training in knowledge translation and policy making. And she's also at uh, uh, McGill University in Montreal. So uh, it's uh, my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Uh, Chicago Thomas and Dr. Majnumer. Over to you guys. Thanks so much, Doug. We really appreciate it. And we're really thrilled to see the broad interest in promoting leisure for children with disabilities. Um, so just before we begin, um, we just have a little knock knock who's there question. So we want to ask people to just write in to Doug what your background is, if you're um, a rehab professional or other health professional or um, perhaps a patient or parent or a more of an administrator or something else. <laughs> uh, just have a sense of who our audience is. So if you can just write that in to Doug um, as we're listening, um, that would be very helpful. Yeah, so this is the first of what will be a few polls throughout this presentation. So just go up, and go ahead and click on the screen and make your selection. Uh, as we know, there's often groups of you, so you'll have to fight amongst yourself to make uh, one choice because we only have one response per line. So uh, but it looks like uh, the answers are coming in, and uh, certainly the vast majority of people are uh, are rehab professionals. At 67% saying uh, of the audience is rehab professionals. 23% identifying themselves as other frontline uh, health professionals. Uh, four percent as administrators and six percent as researchers. Okay, that's wonderful. That gives a good sense that it's primarily um, frontline clinicians. So I guess the first thing I would like to ask all of you to do is um, we're just trying to forward these slides and they're not going forward. Um, a screen. Uh, yeah, there you okay, go. There we go. So I want you to just close your eyes and think of a time in the last weeks where you felt really happy, uh, really maybe laughing or very satisfied with yourself, really having a good time, feeling healthy and really positive. So I want all of you to think about um, a moment or a, an activity that you were doing that made you feel really uh, happy and very satisfied and really in a good state of being. So if everyone has that in mind. Um, I'm just curious to know um, for how many people were you actually doing um, an activity that relates to your work? Um, so if, if, if it was relating to a work activity, just to send a yes to Doug and he could see how many from the 131 lines that we have open right now that there are some people out there thinking about work as a, a happy moment or a healthy moment. Um, then yes, the other <laughs> possible, yeah. I was just going to say, so just uh, for the audience, just type it into the question box. Just uh, if it's related to work. 
uh, this this vision that you're having, just type in a yes or, or a no if it's uh, if it's related to work, and we'll see. Uh, I've got mostly no's coming in so far. <laughs> I haven't had a single yes. <laughs> Uh, I guess I want to know if you were doing some kind of uh, personal care, self-care activity, um, grooming, um, dressing, um, anything like that that's more related to self-care, which is something we spend a lot of time doing um, with our patients. So if that's a yes or no. Yeah, as who still still all knows so far when it comes to dealing with <laughs> and self-care. And I guess so then the obvious question. Is is it one of the, uh, is it a leisure activity? Is it something where you were with family or with friends or doing a hobby or a sport or reading or some kind of leisure, you know, voluntary type of activity that is outside of work and uh, outside of your must-do self, you know, personal maintenance type of activities. So now we've got lots of yeses. We've got, yes, um, we've got running. We've got yes, leisure. We've got yes with family. We've got yes with family and exercise. We've got lots more yeses. So. Yeah, so I guess the point is I think we just underestimate the importance of leisure activities in our life in terms of um, how much it contributes to our health and well-being. Um, you know, it's something that is a small part of our life if we look at number of minutes per day, but it has a very important impact on our well-being. And there's, you know, so therefore it's really important for all of us and includes children and includes children with disabilities. So. Um, so what do we know about the concepts of participation and leisure? So this is sort of the lay of the land in a very brief overview. So leisure can be defined as the freedom from the demands of work, so what we do outside of work when, um, when we're um, at leisure or when we're enjoying our time with uh, some kind of hobby, sport, or relaxing kind of activity. So it's what we do with our free time not when we have to do an essential domestic or, as we call it, uh, instrumental activity of daily living or self-care activity or work activity. So what's very important here is that these are typically voluntary activities where you have a choice and you choose to do these activities during your free time. And it has a very important um, restoring um, uh, value to it and is usually very pleasurable. Um, so it's, that's why it's very important. So as health professionals, uh, since most of the audience is health professionals, we need to recognize how these leisure activities are very meaningful to individuals and valuable to their health and how these experiences make people feel in terms of uh, enjoyment, satisfaction, happiness, relaxation, self-expression. Uh, if we look at some of the literature on children or youth, um, or when we ask adolescents about leisure and, and what their perspectives are on it, you know, the, the overwhelming response is that's when they have fun. That's when they can be with their friends and do the things they want to do. They can socialize. They uh, gain a sense of achievement or mastery motivation. Um, they have control over the things they want to do, um, and they have a sense of belonging because they're part of a community of people, and it makes them feel good about themselves. It's important for their self-identity and their self-esteem. Also, these type of activities are very good in managing anxiety and stress, and so it has a, you know, an important value in that regard. So when we look at health, like how does health and participation and leisure link to each other? So health is defined by the World Health Organization as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of a disease or a disability. So it's important to promote health through activities and experiences that promote good health. And there's been a lot of emphasis on nutrition and physical activity and exercise, but there are many different types of leisure activities that are health promoting in terms of physical and mental health. And there are a number of different documents um, at the international, national level, the World Health Organization documents, Canadian Healthy Living Strategy, and also position page papers um, from different pediatric societies really endorsing healthy living and leisure being part of that physical activity and social activity. 
Um, there is a relationship between quality of life and participation, and we'll get to that in a couple of slides from now. But uh, we also know from the ICF, which is widely endorsed by this group um, in terms of being one of the participation domains of the ICF, in terms of leisure, community, social, and civic life. We also know that there is a concepts of health promotion where we're emphasizing physical health, not just focusing on physical deficits or impairments, and we're trying to support mental health, not just focusing on mental illness. So uh, there is a shift in not only focusing on conditions and impairments and deficits, but also on promoting health and well-being. And this is particularly important for children and youth with disabilities as they're at greater risk for poor physical and mental health. So there are definitely physical health benefits uh, to leisure um, in terms of uh, decreasing risk for a variety of chronic health conditions. And children who are physically active tend to have uh, other, act, other behaviors that are health promoting, they're less likely to take drugs or alcohol, they tend to eat better, they're more uh, in, uh, committed to doing exercise. And so it's really well recognized that being involved in physical activity and sports is important for physical health. But what is less well appreciated is that involvement in leisure activities, when you think about leisure more broadly in terms of social activities, skill-based activities, other recreational activities, there are really important benefits to mental health and at the emotional level in terms of relieving anxiety and stress, uh, in terms of identity formation and uh, achievement and creative expression, and also in terms of social uh, interactions and social connections with important people in their local community, and just feeling uh, healthy and feeling good about yourself. Um, the, we did con uh, conduct a systematic review looking at about, uh, I think it was 19 papers um, where we analyzed the relationships of quality of life and participation. These are very different concepts. Quality of life is more uh, subjective about how you feel uh, in terms of your health and well-being and how satisfied you are, whereas participation is a more objective aspect in terms of the extent to which you are engaged and involved in different life situations. But what we do see is that there are important links between being very involved and participating in physical activity in terms of physical well-being, and just leisure participation in general is associated with aspects of emotional and social well-being. And what is important is doing leisure activities of your choosing, so the preferences aspect of leisure, that you're actually engaging in what you want to do um, is very important for your quality of life. And the flip side of that is if you're not really doing what you want to do, that, that could have a negative repercussion in terms of um, how you feel. And that, you know, the involvement in leisure activities is also very uh, important for the whole family. Um, so when families are engaging leisure activities together, this is a very important uh, aspect of togetherness and positive uh, relationships and cohe building family cohesion. So it's taking away the burden of the must-do activities and focusing the family into activities that are very enjoyable together. And you know, parents report many positive aspects of having a child with disability, and it's these particular activities that really contribute to their ability uh, to appreciate those and value those, those aspects and in terms of adaptive coping. And finally, leisure is really a right. Um, you know, children are important. They have rights, just like all people. And the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, you know, clearly stipulates that, that all individuals have the right to live in dignity and have equal opportunities to participate in all meaningful activities. And in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the right to play is very specifically emphasized. So, you know, this is something that we must ensure that children have this right to participation in these very important activities. Okay, so that brings us to um, the second uh, part of our presentation that is about 
uh, what's the research that has been done uh, on leisure and what are the factors that we see, uh, that we learn from research that is the contribute for participation in leisure for children with disease. So um, I feel the lessons that uh, we learned, as, uh, so as Anatta just said, that it's really important. Right, so um, in a study, uh, in a qualitative study we did asking adolescents what's important for their quality of life, uh, the main thing, one of the main aspects that they brought up was uh, the ability to make choices and to, to, be, uh, to be able to do what is their personal interests and preferences and have opportunity to participate in activities that are age appropriate, that are with their peers. So uh, basically, uh, from this study, we saw that you know adolescents, their adolescents having a cerebral palsy or any other disability is just part of who they are. But it doesn't change the fact that they want to do activities that are meaningful. And uh, as we just saw, leisure is one of the the meaningful activities that should be addressed. The second uh, very important lesson we learned is that, yes, although um, it is very important and valued as an important activity, it's also there are challenges that exist and that limit participation. We know that uh, participation is really decreased uh, for children with uh, different disabilities. We know when compared to same age peers, uh, we do know that they uh, do uh, less variety, uh, less diversity of activities. They also do less uh, in less frequency, so they do many less times than other adolescents or other children. Uh, we also know that lots of the most of the activities they do are home-based and sedentary, and that's an issue. Like they're not in the community, they're less doing active. Um, physical activities. They also do more informal activities, so less structured activities that require less, uh, less preparation and that don't have to face uh, barriers in the community or going out of the house. So uh, at the developmental uh, point of view, this is a problem as we know that adolescents should be going out and about and, uh, and doing things with their peers and they're doing more things at home and with their family. Uh, we also know that although there are significant barriers, they, are, they do enjoy a lot doing leisure activities. So when we ask about levels of enjoyment, they do enjoy doing a variety of activities. But uh, uh, several studies that compared uh, the participation between different disability types and children without disabilities, they found that it's a really uh, there is a difference in participation levels. Um, we also know that our other factors that, that influence participation, we do know that the activity limitations can restrict participation, so mobility uh, is a significant barrier uh, or a significant determinant for less participation. Also age, so as children grow older, they participate less. Uh, boys and girls have different patterns of participation and different preferences too. Uh, and also cultural values uh, that are part of the family. Uh, child preferences, so what they like to do, how motivated they are uh, to try and doing activities that are challenging or to overcome barriers and challenges. Uh, their sense of self-efficacy and self-perception, but all can contribute to, uh, to the levels of participation. So if we are to summarize, like at the child level, uh, we do have to worry about age, gender, mother function, interests and preferences. And uh, on the environmental factors, then we have, uh, as we have professionals in the different program developments, we have to look at the family dynamics. So we do know the family preferences, families that are highly active will have, uh, their child is likely to have to be more active as well. Uh, the school setting, we saw in a few studies that uh, for some uh, kids, being in a segregated school setting will facilitate some types of activities. So they may have more access to physical activities, to social uh, opportunities, but then children in regular settings, for instance, or in inclusive settings, who, who may feel always like left behind or being the last one in, in, to participate. Uh, the type of rehabilitation services and the offer of rehab services, peer support, and the attitudes of others, so even attitudes of strangers, uh, attitudes of uh, you know uh, monitors in activities or teachers and others, accessibility of uh, the built environments, uh, adapted programs, so the existence of programs, and the knowledge of existing resources seems to be a very important factor. Uh, so if families do know about uh, the resources that are available for them or not, and that are adequate for their child. 
Um, yes, yeah, so that just the summary of that. So looking at environmental and physical accessibility, social supports and attitudes, and family socioeconomic status is also another important uh, factor. So the ability to pay for adapted activities, adapted equipment, and uh, parents' educational level may also uh, count as an important um, determinant. When we look at uh, what are the needs uh, in general, so that was not even asking specifically about leisure, we did see that families are rated, again, families of adolescents, we've seen in this specific study, uh, but when listing the most needed activities, uh, they listed the need for suitable leisure facilities as one of the top priorities for their family and for their child, uh, along with emotional support from wider family and receiving information about financial benefits. And uh, interestingly, when we ask also about access then to the activities that they felt they needed, also uh, being able to, to have access to suitable leisure facilities and then enlarged kitchen, which is an interesting for adolescents, trying to participate more in the, in the house and uh, receiving information about financial benefits. So it seems that families do have clear needs that are around leisure. They need to know, they need to have access, they want to have access to the community, but they, they don't for several reasons. So looking at the uh, ICF, which uh, I'm sure um, most uh, in the audience are familiar with, we do look at different aspects of um, of the health condition that influence uh, health in general. So we do address a lot, as Annette mentioned, we do, uh, we use to address a lot of body functions and active limitations. Participation is being more and more uh, important as a, a relevant outcome in rehab interventions. But we also have to look at the environmental and personal factors. And within the environmental factors, one thing that consistently uh, came um, about when we went to, to the different rehab centers to talk about uh, these uh, studies was the lack of policies or the lack of knowledge about policies and programs supporting participation that both rehab uh, professionals or health professionals could have access to inform families about and that families could directly access and then know they exist. So that brings us to the power play. So what's about the power and the policies out there in the system that can help and support uh, participation? So half school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the, that was intentional. <laughs> so we have, uh, so we know about policies. Uh, we did a, a, a map, a policy mapping of all uh, different uh, policies supporting participation across Canada, so looking at the different provinces and also the federal level. And uh, we found out that at the federal level there is this, there exists a few uh, tax benefits that families can use, especially for uh, physical activities and arts. Um, there are also policies that support sports and usually like high performance athletes, Paralympic athletes, the training and uh, how, how to get this into the community. So there are federal pro level programs that support that. And also accessibility of different environments, um, which could include leisure facilities, but that's not specific. At the provincial level, uh, there are several programs in the different provinces uh, that offer some direct funding opportunities, let's say to, to buy adapted uh, bikes uh, to, for children to participate in summer camps, either to, uh, to support participation of children in regular summer camps or to support uh, adapted camps to be developed. Uh, also for leisure companions, so to have someone that will go with the child to the community leisure facility and help them in participating. And also there are specific policies to support sports participation. There are some indirect supports that families can count on, such as general family support for families who have a child with a disability that they can use at their own discretion. Um, also accessibility, again, of you know, the different rules and codes uh, that are supported at the provincial level and adapted transportation, which in some provinces uh, supports any adapted transportation, including to go and attend leisure activities, and some just support a leisure, uh, transportation that is related to health and education, which is an, also an issue that we have to verify and we can inform, help families and inform families about that. But there are some specific gaps that we, uh, we see in policies in general. So many policies address issues of disability, so, but for uh, adults, but not children. 
many policies that are specific for children, some sports policy or physical literacy or physical activities policies, for instance, they do not address the needs of children with disabilities. And many policies address, like for, for people with disabilities or for children with disabilities, address basic needs like education, working, housing, but do not support anything that is related to leisure. And when there are policies that support lesions, sometimes they are not specific for a disability. So those are all uh, gaps in the intersection of the different um, policies. And on the research, for, for the researchers out there, we see that there is a lack of use of uh, research-based evidence in policy making. So that's something that we, we, it would be important to address. So before we continue, uh, perhaps we could see if there are any particular questions or comments from the, this first part that really focuses just on the concepts of leisure and participation and um, what the research findings show. Uh, so there was one question came in from Erin, uh, and and this might be a challenging question. She's she's asking uh, if you know anything about what direct funding is available for things like adapted bikes and that sort of thing. I know that will be different probably province to province. We have people from other countries as well, so I, I'm sure you can't answer that question for any everyone. But did you have, have any thoughts about uh, what direct funding there typically is available? Yes. Well, in Quebec, so this the bike policy uh, was specific in Quebec. Uh, I, other provinces, this didn't come across in our mapping, and we did search all the different provinces. So I can, I can, I don't know what your area is from, but uh, so in Quebec, uh, families can apply through their uh, health center. So it has to be uh, the request has to be made by a healthcare professional, but uh, they can have supports uh, for. A few bikes. I, I can say how many, but there are there are specific funds to have a, to have an adapted bike that you can that any rehab professional could apply for for the family, for the from through the uh, office de personnes capées du Québec. But we will be talking about shortly about a new network called Child Leisure Net and a website in which um, on that website you have a listing of all the policies that um, Keiko referred to by province, so you can map out, depending on which province you are, you can look at uh, your own province and see what policies actually exist that relate to leisure. So that's coming soon. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Yeah, there was one more question from Ashley. Uh, she was asking if all of your research was on kids with physical disabilities or were children with developmental disabilities included as well? So um, we've looked at also, uh, in addition to children and adolescents with cerebral palsy, we, uh, I have a, a doctoral student finishing a study on children with uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we've also just completed studies on adolescents who are at high risk for developmental disabilities. So these are uh, adolescents who were born premature or with congenital heart disease. So these children typically have learning challenges, uh, attention problems, behavior problems, coordination problems, and uh, mental health issues. Um, so these, uh, what we see is that severity of um, disability to some extent influences, like if there's a mobility restriction that's going to restrict uh, physical activity to a greater extent, but it nonetheless doesn't really seem to matter which disability group you're from. There is a decrease in engagement in, in different um, leisure activities overall, um, and that's really the, the major concern is that there is a lack of um, active engagement and, you know, motivation and, and, you know, persistence in the face of challenge may be an important obstacle. And also, like from the, the studies that we are talking about, not all of them are, are studies done by us. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of literature on different populations on, about leisure, and we try to combine some of this information. So there are other groups who have done uh, research in uh, in other disability groups, uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, children with different developmental disabilities, and uh, actually, I think a study by by Mary Law comparing uh, disability groups found that there is not much difference in terms of the barriers they face across the different groups. So you have to look at each child individually, of course, but uh, usually the barriers perceived are the same, and the factors that determine more or less participation are also the same across different diagnoses. So it's uh, it's really about the factors related to the child, to the environment, to the family, but not specific to any diagnosis. 
uh, the one question that just came in, you were you were talking about the website with the list of uh, policies and other resources. That, is is that site available now? Yes. <laughs> okay. we will, and we will we will the, we'll finish with the link. So uh, okay. you right. have to wait to the end. I know. Yeah, that's <laughs> why you have with us. <laughs> All right. All right, we don't want to preempt uh, the big surprise or the big unveil. Uh, but the, she's also asking, will it be available in both French and English? Yes, yes. it is. Yes, it is already available in both languages. All right. Well, that's all we have for questions for now. But just uh, my chance to remind everyone: just type your type those questions in as you uh, as you think of them, and we'll get to some more later in the presentation. That's great. So um, I guess what what we're the two t key take home messages so far is that leisure is very important to physical and mental health and that participation in leisure for children with disabilities is definitely decreased even though the children want to do these activities especially social and physical activities are definitely areas where they want to increase uh, their engagement and they really enjoy these activities but they experience a lot of different barriers that relate not only to the child but to the uh, environment uh, in particular. So how does this play out in real life? So we want to ask you some questions at this point in terms of um, the extent to which in clinical practice leisure um, is uh, embedded in the work that you do. So if you can uh, send responses to Doug about just approximating, like uh, it, looking at these five categories, what percentage of the patients or clients that you see um, do you formally assess leisure in your practice? So anywhere from non, none to almost all of them. All right, so once again, just go up and make your selection on the screen and just give us some sense of what percentage of your patients and clients receive a formal assessment for and leisure. And we certainly recognize that this is very dependent on what your role is, what programs you're part of, if you're in acute care or in home care or community. So, you know, it's not, we're not being judgmental. We just want to have a, like a bit of a lay of the land in terms of, you know, what's going on out there in general. Right. Like in your, cool. your, your therapist in your practice. Yeah. yeah, so if you're a manager, like the group that you oversee, what percentage of their patients do they uh, assess leisure uh, very explicitly? All right, so I think uh, we've got uh, the results are in. So about 25% uh, said most or all, or at least more than 75%. Uh, the, the most common response was about 10 to 50% uh, said so, sort of the sum. 31% uh, of the audience said some receive uh, a formal assessment. And 22% said fewer or less than 10. And only 11% said, no, said none. So. Mm -hmm. so that's promising, I would say, um, you know, and of course it really does depend on the setting and your roles and responsibilities and the types of clients that you see. Now what about, um, let's see now before, we, before we go on, we did have a question from Leslie just sort of came in. She was asking, what do you consider as formal assessment of someone's leisure activities? So I guess that you're actually assessing. You're not just saying, so what's, you know, what's up with lead? Like you're actually doing some kind of assessment. So this is what brings us to the, um, the next two questions. We'll be getting into that a little bit more. So it's not about, it, it doesn't need to be a standardized measure. The, the, the other question was more about if you, if you do formally ask this question. Like if you're actually, it's part of your assessment um, battery or assessment package of the things that you're specifically evaluating, not the methods. So we're going to get to the methods shortly. So in what, in, in how many of your patients or clients um, is leisure a specific goal of your intervention? So this is for those that provide intervention. How often is a, a leisure a specific goal of your intervention? All right, so I'll once again, give everyone a chance to make their selection on the screen. Uh, so uh, the majority, or the, the, the biggest chunk said 50% uh, or better. So 28% saying many in the 50 to 75% range, and 28% saying most or all, the more than 75%, followed by uh, 10 to 50% saying some. Okay, so that's really great. And I guess that kind of reflects your interest in this topic and why you're here uh, to learn more. So that's, that's really terrific. That's really good news. And uh, what would be interesting to hear about maybe at the end of this is who is pushing this agenda? 
Is it coming from the therapist? Is it coming from the families um, or the child? Um, or um, is it a policy of the program or a, a focus of the program in particular? So that would be interesting to discuss at the end. Um, so in terms of when you're assessing leisure, what assessment tools are you using? Are you not, are you just asking, are you asking the question? Are you using a non-standardized checklist? Are you using an individualized assessment approach like the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure or a Goal Attainment Scaling? Or are you using a standardized measure of leisure or a participation that includes leisure? Oh, someone put in a comment that they're actually using more than one of these, and that wasn't an option. I guess we could have made this question in all the time. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Another, another. That is uh, <laughs> doing a lot on the ball. <laughs> yeah, we've got quite a few, well, three or four more people are, are indicating that they use, they do use more than one, and one person saying all of the above they use. So, okay. take a look. So, 42% um, are saying they don't use any of those. 33% uh, saying a checklist or a non-standardized. 18% using an individualized measure, uh, such as the ones you mentioned, and only 7% 7 using some other standardized measure. Okay, great. So now, what, in terms of intervention, uh, what type of intervention approaches are in, are people tending to use? Or, well, they may, are you not using any intervention? Um, or if you are intervening uh, with the explicit goal of leisure, is it mostly individualized, like one-to-one -one treatment? Is it a group program or a consultation? And I recognize that probably there is a mixture, but what would be the most predominant approach? Yeah, we did have another few people commenting that they do use all of them, but that we're here looking for the one that you use them most often. So, mm -hmm. off. Um, the majority, 45%, are using a group program, uh, followed by direct one-to-one -one individualized at 30% and consultation at 25%. Okay, that's great. So it's a real mixed bag. And again, that would probably relate to the type of setting you're in, the clientele that you service, and your particular roles, what type of programs you're part of. Okay. So, um, so if we look, you know, at what's actually going on in the different pediatric rehab centers or schools or, or just out in the rehab world, it seems that in many cases, uh, service delivery still emphasizes the early years in terms of number of hours of therapy, where we put those hours. There still is an emphasis on providing a lot of intervention for children from zero to five years of age um, in acute care, and um, in particularly in rehabilitation centers or community uh, centers. There appears to still be quite a focus on minimizing impairments, um, developmental delays across domains. And in terms of uh, activity limitations, there is an emphasis on mobility and self-care and communication, so the must-do activities that are important for everyday life in terms of things that we must do. But um, where we seem to see much less emphasis in services is um, for children as they get older. There's less and less interventions or uh, consultation or services offered to children as they get older, particularly in adolescence. And for all age groups, health promotion initiatives and programs that are really focusing on leisure specifically um, seem to be lacking. So, um, so what can we do in the field or in, in the front line? Oops. So in terms of assessments of leisure, there actually are quite a few measures of participation and leisure uh, as part of participation. The Life Habits is a, isn't really a measure that was developed for adults. Um, there is a child version of it. It's quite a long measure but it has, provides a lot of detail and it does have a section on leisure. Uh, on the other hand, there's a short measure called the Child and Adolescent Scale of Participation, which um, has um, much, it's only 20 items and it looks at participation in the home, school and community and gives you just a sense of level of participation in, in all different environments. Um, the PEMCY, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> 
is a new measure <coughs> that looks at <coughs> participation across um, all domains um, and also it provides some information about environment <coughs> and whether environment is a facilitator or a barrier to participation. So that's a fairly new measure and um, really provides a good summary of participation in the context of environment. Um, there is also the pediatric activity card sort uh, for children of school age, looking at personal care, uh, school, hobbies, social, sports activities. Um, it looks at about 75 different activities using cards, so it's very user-friendly for children, and it just gives you a sense of to what ex to if whether children are participating in these activities and how often. And then there's the PEGS, um, which is for young children, six to nine years of age, and also uses pictures and uses a format um, where you, for each activity, children, they show a, a picture of a children who is more competent in that activity and a child who is less competent and the extent to which a child sees themselves as being competent or not so competent and to what extent. So that's more about their perceived self um, a reflection on their abilities um, to engage in those activities. Um, so there are a range of different participation activities that include leisure. And then, of course, there is um, individualized assessments that focus on very specific leisure activities, like the COPM and goal attainment scaling. And um, the, the children's assessment of participation and enjoyment is a comprehensive measure specifically about leisure. But I guess, you know, the, it's even just asking the child what it is that they want to do and going from there in terms of finding ways for the children to overcome any personal environmental barriers to their participation in the activities that they really want to do. Um, so in that sense, um, the real focus of uh, leisure participation is focusing on the contextual factors because they're more likely to be modifiable. Um, so looking at what it is the child wants to do, what's important to them, because if it's something that they really want to do, they're more likely to enjoy it, they're more likely to be motivated and persist in the face of challenge. Um, it's important to think about mastery and give them um, something that's, you know, the just right challenge, and it may be a good idea to start with a, a safe environment where they can fail, um, but they can practice and gain confidence in doing certain activities. Um, also, you know, we want to kind of minimize the help that we provide children in doing those activities uh, and enable them to participate in ways that are meaningful and engaging and allow them to try things out in different ways. Um, so, um, there is a tendency for us to be overly helpful, which in a sense can restrict their mastery and their motivation to really try things on their own or with minimal support. So it's important to think about that. Um, and group activities are particularly motivating. You know, when children are with other children, they'll uh, try to model them, they'll help each other, there's a sense of competitiveness as well, and they see that in some ways they're better than other children if it's children with other disabilities as well. So it's a really good um, environmental context to consider and uh, to engage children in leisure activities. Um, there should also be a strong focus on the task itself and looking at ways to modify the task so that the child is able to participate. And then, as Keiko mentioned, there's also looking at resources and supports and policies and advocating for those so that we can expand the possibilities for children with disabilities. Um, it's, uh, it's really important to direct families to the resources that exist because often, especially as children get older, they may not be aware that there are actually adapted programs or services that are available for their children. Um, so we have to find ways to, um, to inform families about what resources and uh, leisure supports there are available. Okay, so that brings us to um, some of the, the cards that uh, they are playing now that are currently being developed to uh, promote participation. So are we going to 
tell you about some uh, studies that are ongoing um, and then some solutions that uh, we've been working on mm -hmm. with different groups. So um, we do know that there are different interventions uh, that are now being tested. So interventions targeting specifically the environment uh, knowing that they can be effective to promote participation, so modulating uh, the activity or making changes according to individual preferences, and environment adaptations like coaching or you know uh, instructing the center, let's say community center, uh, giving uh, um, courses to professionals who are offering leisure activities in the community about specific disability needs or providing fact sheets to uh, to the, the centers about certain types of disabilities. So Dana and Abby here at McGill uh, has been uh, developing a study showing that interventions like that can be cost effective and can indeed uh, promote more participation for these children. And uh, also Robert Felzano has developed some interventions that are focusing on leisure. So the results of this are promising and uh, I, I think we'll see a lot lots of other interventions coming soon that can be tested in the, in the clinical settings and in the community. Uh, we're also working uh, on a project that is called Community Partners for Children's Participation or LCP Square, uh, where uh, we have put together a great group of stakeholders including families, uh, youth, community organizations, uh, NGOs at different levels, um, and policy uh, people public health and other, a great group of researchers, which I should have listed here and apologize, I just realized. Uh, but uh, we are basically trying to develop, uh, to think together of an intervention that will take into account uh, social deprivation, so knowing that socioeconomic status is one important determinant of participation. So looking at the public funded policies and programs that exist uh, in the different health regions, and we're starting in Quebec. Uh, but looking at how that can influence participation levels. So combining uh, the geographical location where the family lives and what are the programs and resources that are offered within that area and how we can work uh, with, with these families and then with the, the health and community services in this region to provide or to change uh, participation levels by changing really the community and the policies that are offered. So uh, this also is, uh, is in development, so you should hear from that soon. Um, leveling the playing field. And so now we're going to talk about uh, Child Leisure Net, which was the initial um, objective <laughs> of this webinar. So um, we are, to, to tell you about uh, this network that uh, we, we, uh, we will tell you more about, but also to tell you what we've been seeing and by putting stakeholders together, factors and things that can be done to try to level the playing field a little bit. Um, so Child Leisure Net is that Child Health Initiatives, Limiting Disabilities Through Leisure. And it's a, it's a network of stakeholders. I hope that some of you are in the audience today. Uh, but basically, we had families, youth, policymakers at different levels, healthcare providers, community organizations, researchers, uh, education professionals too, uh, that we have done three forums in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver last year. Uh, there will be a new forum now in Calgary that is actually a uh, is being promoted by the city of Calgary with um, uh, an emphasis on physical literacy, but all the other pro uh, the other forums, the objectives were really to bring a network, bring stakeholders together to brainstorm solutions and to think about um, activities that or solutions to promote participation. So. Um, Within these forums, we uh, we did a few things. We presented uh, a bit of the content that uh, we presented to you today, but we also uh, asked for participants to think about barriers that they face in their daily lives in relation to leisure, and then to come up with possible solutions, and then to prioritize. So uh, to to choose, and as a group, who did a group activity to choose which activities should be prioritized or what we could do together as a network to promote leisure. The top activity that was chosen as a solution was uh, to create a central list of adaptive leisure resources, activities, and programs that could be used by families, healthcare providers, and community programs. So uh, this solution, uh, we uh, worked together with uh, through different uh, development funds, Hacking Health, and different uh, Rick Hansen Foundation. Uh, well, we found support and also NeuroDevNet. 
um, uh, which uh, we should have uh, <laughs> be acknowledging here for, for the support and the development of this resource. So we've been talking a little bit more about uh, Jouy. I don't know if you heard, uh, but it's basically an app that will be available very, very soon for um, both iOS and Android and a web-based version as well. But the objective is really to create awareness about existing programs and uh, users could uh, develop a, a leisure profile in the, in the app so they could uh, favorite activities that they like, put ratings, comments, and also the possibility to interact through social media. Uh, this uh, resources. What we would like to do with the information that will that is growing is that you see, okay, what children, youth with disabilities and families are interested in do, interested in doing, and what they would like to do but are not doing, perhaps. So, what types of activities that are not listed that uh, we should add? So, this is uh, this app is going. Uh, I'm going to see if this works. If, oh no, sorry. Okay, wait, it works. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so the uh, app, I'll invite you to go and explore um, the website. But basically, uh, for now, the app is just, just being submitted this week to the App Store and uh, to the Google Play for Android. And uh, the website should go live as of next week, I want to say. <laughs> so, fingers uh, crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Everything works fine. But basically, right now, we have in the app um, provinces. Uh, we have Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia, and some resources for Saskatchewan through partnership. So we're doing, we do have um, uh, people listing and searching for activities, web-based information, and also information that came from our different partners. So in BC, uh, Sunny Hugh gave us a list of suggestions. In uh, Toronto, we had a list from Blurview, from other different partners in Montreal. Mackay Center also gave us a list of resources that they knew. So basically, it's compiling information that has been in the in the information boards, perhaps in the in the rehab centers, or that uh, recreational therapists or OTs or education professionals had a list of paper information. We're trying to convert all of that into a web-based resource that is that can be constantly updated and that can. The, the people can access. So as you see here, you can see that this, can you see, uh, Doug, the, that work? Uh, yeah, we can see the, the screenshots there on the screen. Okay, so uh, so just to, to give you a sense, so basically you can put any comments uh, and rates and you have the description of the activity. Uh, you can search by activity types and it will also display by proximity. So this, this is a very far away one, but <laughs> when so you use it, it's GPS. based on GPS on your phone. So uh, that could, uh, it will tell you which activities are close to you and in a general map, which type of activities you can see. You can create a list of favorite activities. You can create your profile through the app. You'll also be able to uh, be linked to uh, the Channel Disability website, which we'll tell you about. So this is um, a little bit of the app. We can, you can sign up in the website to receive information. Uh, we've been on featured on CTV uh, Canada AM for those haven't seen and uh, the Gazette in Montreal. You can complete your information here and uh, uh, if you want, and then when as soon as the app is released, we gonna uh, you're gonna receive this information. So, um, so that's we. <laughs> Uh, let me just try to get back to this. Okay, so uh, the other uh, priority that was uh, established in these different forums from Child Leisure Net was actually to create a network of champions that are interprofessional in composition and to provide support and leadership to enable community use of leisure for children and youth of special needs. These are the wordings from the forums, okay? And uh, basically uh, what uh, we then created uh, was child, uh, Child Leisure Net Network. So anyone can join uh, the network. Uh, so I will click. It. So that's the website we're telling you about. The what we call the, the link to the feature. Um, just see. Okay. So on the link to leisure uh, website, there are a few different uh, aspects that uh, we try to pull together. And again, all by suggestions of stakeholders and all the content is what people felt was relevant. Uh, science says you will find research articles related to leisure all summarized in lay language short summaries. 
you also find the link for other websites uh, that have information about uh, leisure and that are evidence-based. And uh, also measures of participation, some of the, the ones that we mentioned and today, and this is going, is going to be added, um, the site is under development, but it's already um, available for use. Um, on parent says we try to put together information that might be relevant for parents, so some interesting videos related to leisure, showing kids for dating and succeeding, so that could give a good idea. Blogs, we are going to fit this information here, and we are open to receive any suggestions. Um, and also, like, we have some pins uh, on pent rest that, relation, that relate to recreational therapy or to leisure participation, and uh, other resources that can help. In the ideas board, uh, you can find information about the Child Leisure Net. So we have also created three working groups in front three, each of the three forums that we've done so far, and the groups have decided which they what they want to work on. So these groups are super uh, transdisciplinary. They're really they're program managers, there are community organizations, there are parents involved and policymakers. So all the groups are open. If you would like to participate, here's the description. The working group one is working in a solution that is school-based, so how we can promote participation through um, school-based activities, so that's in, in development. Uh, the working group two is working on developing a program, a uh, peer or mentorship program for parents or children, a web-based um, program, so we are currently doing a scoping review of the literature, see what programs are available, and uh, parents and community organizations are bringing suggestions of good programs that have been done and what can we model and see uh, and test. And the third working group, as the Vancouver-based group, is working on a policy table. So uh, looking at uh, community and municipalities that have succeeded in promoting participation for children with disabilities, taking best practice models, ideas of what they did, how they've done it, and uh, to, to promote um, policies in this direction. You could ask to request to join, uh, to join a working group, and then after you join and approved, you will be able to log into the working group area and uh, and have access to the, all the group activities. We have tests for each group every month uh, across the country, so that's very interesting group to join. If you're interested, you can uh, contribute and participate and bring these ideas to your uh, practice as well. Uh, we also have listed a few programs that uh, foster leisure participation or funding opportunities or camps and other ideas, programs that are well-developed and people could model from. Here are the policies that we've uh, talked about. So, so right now we have Ontario, Quebec, BC, Alberta, if I'm not mistaken, but we do have information for all the policies. It's just being loaded. Uh, so soon it will be available. If you click in your province, you will have a list of all the, the policies, let's say Ontario, all the policies that support leisure. And then you can click on and you'll have the information about the document, what's the content, who can benefit, and the main mechanisms, and you can get to the website uh, to see more information. So that's uh, available for, it will be available soon for all the provinces, is right now for a field then, but uh, you can consult this information and see what's in your region that can be used. Um, so, and then we're also feeding here some success stories related to leisure. Uh, this is a, our premature uh, study. Uh, so, these are a few examples from there, but we want to grow this list of success so that people can see that, yes, children can participate and can have fun. Um, we also have, so here you have the link for the, for the Jouet app and uh, for uh, the members area which will load soon. Oh, okay. So uh, in the members area, we wanted to create a space for discussion, and that also came from the different stakeholders saying it would be important to have a safe space where people can discuss different topics. So um, we, this has, the site has just, just been launched, so we see that the forums are still empty and mm -hmm. waiting for you right after this. <laughs> Go in and create some good discussion oh. topics. So you can, you have, it was registered because that's the, the one safety component but it's not complicated, it's a one-step registration process, and you can create, uh, we've suggested some ideas for educators, for parents, policymakers, but you can really add any new um, topics and discuss, and the idea is really for this to be a space for exchange uh, of ideas, solutions, and um, what can be useful for everybody. So please go in, uh, and you can also submit here, you see 
that you can submit new content. So if you do have, if you do know of an excellent literature program in your area that you'd like to submit or a policy that is not listed or any resource uh, for the parents, say if you know of videos of uh, ideas for parents, fact sheets, anything uh, that you think could be relevant for and useful for the community, you can submit a new content here. So this is, um, so this is Child Internet. Please do join uh, and let's uh, make this group grow. This is the idea. So uh, you can be part of the working groups, as I mentioned. Uh, you can read the description, sign up, and you'll be you join our network and the, the teleconference. You see, it's lots of fun, and there are lots of great ideas uh, <laughs> that are happening uh, in the different discussion groups. So uh, here are all the links. We do have, so Sunny Hill Evidence Center has um, invited us to join a tweet chat. I don't know if I'm saying this right, tweet chat <laughs> at one. So uh, we do have some, spa uh, some uh, I know we have some uh, space for questions now, but then you take a break. <laughs> and then if you are, you will, if you are into Twitter, um, you will be uh, having the discussion. The idea is really to carry on this discussion on Twitter uh, and to have other people joining with questions, suggestions, yeah, for, should be for about 30 minutes. So um, do join the hashtag as LeisureNet. And uh, you can connect uh, through uh, Sunny Hill App and Center, which Twitter is there. Uh, I'm going to be tweeting with a child, Childhood Disability Link uh, Twitter account. So, uh, and we're going to be both of us in the background here tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that should be fun. Um, so please do join if you can, starting at 1. Uh, um, so that's it for our presentation. Thank you. We would love to have questions and a good time for discussion. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much for that great presentation. There, there were a bunch of questions came in. A whole bunch came in when you started talking about the Jue uh, app. Uh, yep. But we're going to go back. Uh, there were a couple questions before that. So before we get to the ones about the app, there was a question that came in when you had the list of um, assessment measures on the screen. So you had the uh, life habits and the PMCY and, and, and those ones. And uh, Shannon was asking, are any of these measure, assessment measures appropriate for children who are nonverbal or who can't respond about their perceptions of leisure? Well, some of them have parent report measures, um, like the PEMCY is a parent report measure. I, so some of these can be done by a proxy. Um, whether they have adaptations, let's say using a communication board or some, I guess you could use a communication device for them to indicate um, whether activity when they're sorting the cards, like for the pegs and the uh, packs, um, to indicate a yes/no type of thing. Um, so th you know that could be a way of modifying it. But several of these have both parent and um, or only parent report mm -hmm. at this point. Um, HAPE is, uh, is typically done with the child with the assistance of uh, a parent as needed. And it has, uh, it has it's, uh, it's meant to be child friendly, it has pictures yeah. and the child can point, you know, for the different scales. So let's say for enjoyment they can show like the happy faces uh, level. So yeah, so they, they are definitely child friendly, simple, simplistically presented. Um, but there are certainly um, proxies can be used as well or assist. And you also had lots more information on the link to leisure site about some of these uh, tools as well, so people can get a little more information about some of these if they go there. Yes. Yeah. Well. So that, yeah. So details about the, the measures are there. Uh, there are not all of them there yet, but we'll add. Uh, yes, it's been added. <laughs> In <Sure. top. laughs> Um the next question came from Ashley. We were, you were talking about the different forums that you were holding across the country. She was just wondering if there's any plans to hold one in Ottawa. <laughs> we hadn't planned yet, but maybe. <laughs> it's, uh, well, the, so Child Legion at the, the first uh, two forums, so the Toronto and Montreal, was a CHR. Uh, funded dissemination project. Then we applied for a, another for Edith Strauss uh, Foundation. Pro re rehabilitation knowledge translation project that uh, helped us, that made it possible to go to Vancouver. Uh, then we have the invitation of the City of Calgary uh, is through a grant that they got through to do the Calgary. So through physics for physical literacy. So yeah. at this point, yeah, they were invited us. So they're they're that. So we're participating in in something that they were carrying out that was very similar. So they're capitalizing on 
this process that we're working together. We'll be happy to go to Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, I suppose that all depends on if Ottawa beats Montreal in the first round of the playoffs. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that can change. <laughs> all right. Uh, we did have a – so the, the next group of questions all uh, came in when you started talking about the Jouet uh, app, uh, and some of them were sort of answered as you went through, but we'll sort of go through some of these questions anyways. Uh, the first question was uh, asking if it's in French as well. Yes, in yeah, so if all, all the websites are in French. Uh, it's just actually the, the designer just, just finished the back end yesterday. So, it will, the, so the French switch button is not up yet, but it will be uh, by the end of the week okay, for the website. For the app as well, for Jouy, there, uh, it will go with your phone settings. So if your phone settings are to French, you will have all the French options. The activity descriptions in French are for only Quebec. for Quebec. Uh, Yes, but but the 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 other all the settings and uh, everything else is in French as well. All right, and and a, a few a bunch of questions came in specifically around the uh, uh, um, sort of what areas are covered. I mean, you, and you did talk about that that it it is now it's mostly Quebec, but it, it now includes. Can you yeah. just go over the list of who it includes as well? It really includes, I think, over six hundred uh, um, programs across British Columbia, Alberta parts of Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Quebec. Um, and so we had hired summer students to look on the web for every kind of program. We also approached rehab centers that had listings. Um, but the whole idea is to get us started with, you know, a big chunk of programs, but we're relying on the users to then tell us if there are some that they are aware of that don't exist currently on the Jouet app to send them to us and then we will feed the information, you know, immediately onto the Jouet app, and it'll be immediately uploaded for whoever has the app. So if there are, uh, so the, and the, the provinces were just that, like where we had partners at this point, but we have a partner with Trevor Relins Foundation uh, for a Canada Summer Student Grant that will have over the summer will have students to to search for activities in other provinces and also to update information if need be. So the idea is that it really grows to all provinces. We had like after the the the, the Canada the CTV coverage, there are lots of people who contact us from Nova Scotia from other provinces asking if we would have. We definitely want to. It's a matter of building the, the resource list. So if people are aware of, you know, let's say there are rehab centers or community organizations that have good listings of activities that they can send our way and uh, we can definitely, we'll be adding actively. All right. Well, Sarah uh, from New Brunswick was specifically asking about New Brunswick, so I guess uh, she needs to talk to you guys and start. Uh, started with a list of a bunch of activities or programs. We will then do our homework at this end in terms of putting the descriptors because what the app does is it tells you, let's say if you're looking for adapted yoga, it'll list them by GPS. Uh, it gives you a basic description of the program, a mapping of the, where it is located, and then contact information, the website, Facebook, telephone, um, yeah. email, so that, that then you can go get the more detailed information about schedules and costs and things like that. But the app itself is available, so you can, uh, when as soon as it becomes available in the App Store or in, uh, for Android, you can download from any province. It's the database in the back end that we are building gradually. Yeah. yeah, but it will be coming. And, and again, if people have ideas of places and resources, they can submit. We will make our best to keep entering them. All right. So the next, uh, there was a sort of a group of questions that came in uh, with people asking how. Uh, so I'll just sort of read a few of the questions. They're all sort of similar. Um, the first one was, can individual agencies upload their leisure-related information? Does Do program providers have the ability to submit their own information? And how can we provide information that's not listed? Is that the submit content button that's on the on the web page? Yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah, on the web page you will see. Uh, so the submit content was on the on the link to leisure web page. On the app itself, uh, there are two ways to submit content. So basically, uh, when the app will be available, and it's really too bad, we really want it to be released for today, but it was not possible. But uh, if you can go and submit, uh, suggest a new activity in the settings. There, in the settings, there is a suggest a new activity. What it does, it generates an email form, basically. So you can submit, you can already submit if programs, if people who are in the you audience can send to Jouet <laughs> at uh, childhooddisability.ca. I should have put the email there. Yeah, Jouet at childhooddisability.ca. 
So uh, we'll add to the slides uh, when you, you put it online, Doug. So basically, if you submit yeah, any program, exactly, if it's a community organization or a program that offers, we had this already, actually, uh, uh, people who sent us emails saying, uh, we offer this adapted camp, and we've added information right away. So we have to add this information at this point because uh, it needs some moderation, and we make sure that we have all the information in the different fields for the app. But uh, if you can send right away, and we'll add it in as soon as we can. So jue at uh, childhooddisability.ca. All right. And uh, Leslie's asking if uh, if you can add activities from small towns outside of the major centers. And I'm assuming the answer is yes. It'll just be based on yeah. GPS coordinates yes. and everything. Will yeah, yes, exactly. Exactly. It's all it's all dependent on GPS. So yeah. It, you yeah, can so, it. yeah. so any activities anywhere. <laughs> Yes, any activities anywhere, exactly. Well, we're focusing on Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're getting requests from the States, from the states now, too. Yeah, and Brazil. And <laughs> yeah. But the technology is there. Like, we can, it's a matter of creating the list. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next question came from uh, Emily. She's asking if you've uh, had any collaboration with the Canadian Paralympic, uh, Paralympic Committee and their resource portal. Right, so actually uh, through one of the working groups, the working group one, which is the, the Ontario-based, the, the school-based program, uh, through the Ability Center, so the Ability Center is one of the members of the working group one, and they have, they have actually pilot testing the Paralympics uh, Committee school program and uh, through the Ability Center, and that's part of what we're waiting to see the results and see how as a network we can contribute to. So, and also here in Montreal at Mackay, actually uh, the, uh, the Mackay Center and the school board is looking at implementing the, the school, the, the Paralympics school program as well, like and look at different components. What uh, we are trying to collaborate with is like, to see if there's any information that uh, we can provide or any resources that are specific that, that we can inform as a network or also if for activities that are not related to physical or to sports, right? Uh, if the, the same type of program can be used uh, for other types of activities. So that's how we're... That's what that yeah. work group is really looking at right now. All right, so we had a couple more questions came in afterwards about where do we send information to update UA, who can submit, et cetera. Again, it's, it's anyone can submit. It goes through a moderation process, and the, the links are on the childhooddisability.ca uh, yeah. website. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and you can, you can I, I just added to the slide, I don't know if you can still see the slides, but I, the, the email is there. So anyone can submit by email, it's probably the easiest way at this point. Yeah, if, you just, if you just share your screen again, we'll put your, your slide back up so yeah. people can see that. So when the, as soon as the app is available, you'll be able to submit um, through the app. For now, you can use this email and submit any activities. All right, so we had a couple more questions came in back about the assessment measures. Um, uh, Sarah's asking, are any of the assessment measures free, and are any of them bilingual? Mm -hmm. um, so the CAPE and the PEN CY are bilingual, bilingual but are not free. And life habits. And life habits. But they all cost money now. Yes. Um, so it's not, it's a very uh, reasonable, I know for the CAPE and the yeah. PEN CY it's a very reasonable they're price. They're not very expensive because yeah. they're... There's no equipment really to purchase. It's not like a big test kit. It's just really a manual. Yeah. So the other ones I don't know about language, but those for sure I, I know they're French. Yeah, Pepsi Y K and Life Habits are definitely um, and COPM are all bilingual. Yeah, but there is a cost. I don't think any of them are free. All right. Um, uh, Christelle is asking if it's possible to have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, are you able to share the slides with us? Well, you've already sent them to me. Am I able to post them? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, so so they'll be on the Knowledge Exchange Network uh, where we post the recording and everything else. So just to, in case anyone has questions about uh, sharing this presentation, we do record it, and you will receive an email with a direct link uh, so that you mm -hmm. can share it with, uh, with anyone that you would like. Um, and... Uh, Elaine is asking how they w how someone might find out more information about the forum being held in Calgary. Uh, right, What's so the that? forum in Calgary is uh, Darlene from the city of Calgary. Uh, perhaps she can email us. You can email me. You can give me my email, I guess, uh, Doug, and uh, we can send more information because it's the the they're, they're organizing, so we're not uh, doing the guest list for the the Calgary forum. 
but so on uh, May 13th. It's on May 13th. Yes. Okay. I forgot the name of the venue now, but if um, I can give my email or and you, you they can contact me. So we can if you want to email at keiko.thomas at mcgill.ca. Okay. And we'll be sure to link that email address to the to the Knowledge Exchange Network page where this information will be as well. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, Andrea, back to the Jouet app. Uh, Andrea is asking, uh, does it only include adapted activities or also organizations that are inclusive to individuals with disabilities? Yeah, both. So we do have inclusive activities as well. So there's a lot of the activities. Uh, provided from the YMCA, I'm just thinking of one, but let's say the YMCA uh, activities that are inclusive or that they're all, they can also be listed, yes. And what we do is like in the activity description, you see like some activities that are very specific or let's say there are activities that describe themselves as targeting kids with autism or with visual impairments or whatnot, then that's in the description. If not, uh, these are many of them are inclusive, so it's for both. All right. Uh, Edwidge is asking, have you done any work in Quebec with uh, the associations AlterGo and k -Rule? Uh Yes. <laughs> they have actually, uh, they, they, are, they were part of the farms. Uh, k -Rule could not come to the farm, but we are in contact with them now. Altergo and the Fisboxive, yeah. yes, we are we're connecting with them now. We'll probably be, uh, we'll try to distribute some jouet material at the, the Fisportive that is coming soon. And uh, Autergo is also going to share uh, the, their list of resources uh, with us and vice versa. <laughs> so Autergo, they also have a community list at Montreal, basically, but uh, we'll, add, we'll make sure to add their resources and they will link jouet to their, uh, their website as well. So, yes. All right. Did you have a date for the uh, session in Calgary? Just another question about the Calgary Forum. 13th. May 13th? Yes. Yeah, okay. May 13th. 9 to 3.30. That's what I seem to remember. Yeah. And so it's a full day uh, forum. And I just don't remember the venue, but we can the send venue, information. There, it was a group that's focusing on physical literacy, but um, they had heard about our forum in Vancouver and, and liked the format of it. So we're kind of embedding our format within their group activity. So it'll be a little bit of a co combination. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Andrea is saying that this, that this is all so great, so in capital letters, so I'm very excited. She says it's extremely useful for their clients and families. Um, she's asking, will you be doing any education sessions, tutorials, or anything like that for families about uh, how to use the Jouet app? She could see that be, being something that families that she works with that they would, mm -hmm. they would like to attend probably. Right, so that's a good point. Well, we do have embedded a tutorial in the app itself. So when you open it for the first time anytime, uh, it will guide you through the different features and how to. So it should be simple enough. <laughs> uh, and with the like, we made the tutorial with that in mind so that families know what to do. But basically, it operates like any, like many of the uh, search apps. I don't know if I can say, <laughs> let's say Yelp or TripAdvisor, you know, like apps that are to find things. So Yelp is to find restaurants. This is to find adaptive leisure activities. So right. it's with the opportunity yeah. to rate them and set comments as well. So that those features are in our app as well. So, um, so people can interact more with it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, we have a yes. should be there. Um, if and again, there is a room for contacting us at any time from the app. We have someone that is working on responding to all the emails, so we hope this will be user-friendly enough that people will be able to use it. <laughs> Definitely been an interesting learning experience for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did have a few more questions about the different email addresses that you put up, I think whether it's yours, uh, Keiko, or the Jouet uh, address. Uh, so we'll make sure we get all that stuff up on the Knowledge Exchange Network so we can, and if anyone does have trouble getting in touch with uh, these folks, just don't hesitate to contact me uh, at dmainer at capsi.org and I'll be happy to make, uh, make the connection. Um, we did have one last question, and I think it'll be... Sorry, what was that? We're happy to receive emails personally as well if people have specific comments or suggestions. 
Sure. All right. Um, we did have a, a one more question come in about the sort of the submitting process, and, and basically I, I think we might have answered this, but we'll just re review it one more time. She's asking, is there a process to determine if a program is appropriate to children with, with disabilities prior to being posted? And I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the process is that when you submit through that link on your site, that it goes through a moderation process. That's correct? Right, and we go to the websites of those. So that's why we started with the, what the rehab um, centers recommended. And, we, and as we get recommendations, we look at the websites and, and what programs they offer. Um, but, you know, we cannot possibly go and verify ourselves each program. So there is, uh, in the terms and conditions of the app, that that's sort of special. Yeah. You know, we can't that's ensure yeah. that every program is what they say it is. We can only say what's out there and advertised. Yeah, and then the other value of the app is is when people do uh, participate in these programs, there is that rating and commenting process right. that helps sort of the community sort of curate these uh, these programs. Exactly, and that's the idea, right? It's to build uh, the community awareness, and it's the same thing when you see a review of someone who done it and like they said it's successful, but it's not, or they said that there's this program, but there's not, or the opposite, this program is awesome, and this monitor is super good. So that's what you want people to be able to see, you know, what's the, just like the other apps, <laughs> where yeah. you see the reviews, and you can have a sense of what activity looks like. Yeah. All right, well, I think we've exhausted the questions. Um, Again, someone asking for uh, presentations and email addresses, and we will uh, you will get a link from this from the system with a link to the page on the CAPC Knowledge Exchange Network uh, that's on your screen now. Uh, we'll post everything up there where it says uh, click here to register. All that information will be replaced with all of the various recordings, resources, PowerPoint presentations, contact information, everything else uh, that we can put up there. Um, all right, so before we wrap up, is there any, any sort of closing comments uh, that you guys would like to share with the audience before we wrap up? Well, I just I feel um, really excited about the level of interest across the country on the topic. Um, and so, you know, what's really important is that we bring people together in different formats to really learn from each other and move this agenda forward to ensure that children have the opportunity to participate fully in the activities they want to do. Mm -hmm. So it's really wonderful to see this level of engagement um, across Canada. And we really encourage uh, people to, to join join the network through the website, um, participate in the tweet chat at one. Uh, that's another possibility to interact a little bit more. But uh, joining like all the um, all the, the different resources, the app, uh, the the website, they're built to be uh, useful resources for people. So uh, any comments, feedback, ideas, suggestions, it's all very welcome, and it's meant to be an engaging knowledge creation and exchange process. So uh, we hope people can do that. Go in, join, give us suggestions, talk to us. <laughs> We're very willing to uh, to move this forward together. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you again for such a fantastic presentation, for some great work. Uh, the Jouet app is it looks great. LeisureNet and everything about it is it's just it's fantastic. From the comments that I've I've seen pop up here and the appreciation, I, the audience I think shares that as well. So so thank you very much for such a great presentation. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Yeah, no, no problem, and uh, and I think we'll wrap up. Uh, we do our, uh, Wednesday, our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and it's always great if you can watch live as your questions and comments, as we can see from today's uh, uh, discussion, uh, really enrich your comments really enrich the discussion, and your questions really enrich the conversation. So, But if you can't watch live, as I mentioned a few times, the, we do record these sessions, and they are all made available on the Knowledge Exchange Network after the fact. Uh, coming up in the next few weeks, we have a great lineup. Uh, next week, we will be bringing the always challenging topic of Children's Mental Health uh, back to the CAPC Presents uh, stage, and we'll be sh uh, in a session called A Tale of Two Programs, and we'll be showcasing two different approaches uh, to addressing capacity and service delivery issues uh, for uh, delivering mental health uh, services to children and youth. Um, and we'll be bringing our colleagues from the Saskatoon Health Region to share one program about building capacity uh, across the province, and uh, and we'll also be bringing uh, some colleagues from the IWK Health Centre in Halifax uh, to share their program, which is really about changing their whole philosophy about how they approach uh, children's mental health in the in the acute sector. Um, and so they're going to be sharing all of their experiences with us uh, next week. Following that, we'll be taking a week off as the uh, CAFC Board of Directors has their annual retreat, so there'll be no webinar uh, that uh, Wednesday. But following that on May 6th, we'll be coming back with one that has a 
rather interesting name and when someone to when they approached us and asked if we'd be willing to do this session I said no problem and now that I have to say shit happens all the time I really it's it's not as easy as, as it sounds to say that but it, it it is a really interesting session called shit happens and, and it's a parent-led initiative using social media and research and I assure you if you attend the somewhat offensive title will make a lot more sense uh, as we hear about a very interesting parent-led project uh, that's turned into a research partnership aimed partnership aimed at identifying and addressing uh, the most important information needs related to caring for a child with uh, Hirschsprung's disease and other rare diseases. So it's it's not specific to Hirschsprung's disease, it's really a presentation about how a parent-led initiative uh, really brought together uh, a disparate group of, uh, of parents and families and practitioners to share information about rare diseases. So uh, you definitely want to join us for that one uh, to hear a little bit more about that program. So lots of great stuff coming up. Thanks for joining us uh, today and we hope to see you back here next week. Thanks everyone and goodbye. Thank Thanks you. so much.